you will hear a radio announcer giving details of the evening's broadcast programmes. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. The time is 6.55 on Thursday, October the 15th, and now here is a brief review of this evening's programmes on Radio 6. Starting in just a few minutes at 7 o'clock, we have the first programme in our new series, Animal Talk, a documentary with Laura Martins and Jeff Burns, and I'll be telling you some more about that in a minute. Then at 7.50 there will be a broadcast on behalf of the Rare Species Protection Group, telling you about some of the work they're doing to preserve endangered species. This will be followed at 8 o'clock by today's episode of Park Square, our drama series following the fortunes of a close-knit community in North London, in which Sunita begins to wonder if Carl has been telling her the truth, and Carl gets into trouble when a private email is read by the wrong person. At 8.30 we have our phone-in programme, What's Your View? Today's topic is the impact of the media, and you are invited to call in with your own views and questions on this topic. If you have a question for the panel, the number to call is 0207 815 2 this will be followed at 9 o'clock by news and weather, and then at the new time of 9.20, we have our Book of the Week, read by Graham Stanish. This week's book is a collection of Rudyard Kipling's Just So stories, which the author wrote for his children at the beginning of the 20th century, and which are now enjoyed by children and adults alike. This evening's story, entitled How the First Letter Was Written, is an imaginary account of the events that led to the invention of writing, involving a young girl called Taffy, and a series of misunderstandings that arise when Taffy sends the first written message in the history of the world. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. And now, some more information about our major new documentary series, Animal Talk, which explores the fascinating area of animal communication. Tonight's programme compares the communication systems used by two of the world's largest creatures, the killer whale and the elephant. Although these might seem like very different creatures, in fact there are a lot of similarities between them. They're both mammals, they both live in groups, and the social bonds they form are extremely strong. For example, when a new elephant is born, the others in the group will all gather round to greet it. They also live for a long time, like humans, and their brains are very large, which means that there may be room for something in there that allows them to process some type of language. In the programme, Laura Martins, who has spent many years studying the communication systems of whales, describes how although whales do have very good sight, like humans they mostly use sound to communicate. In the case of whales, this is because this travels well in water, where visibility may be limited. In the programme, you'll hear underwater recordings of the whale calls, but what we don't know yet is whether the whales are talking to one another or whether the sounds are just to allow them to identify one another. Also speaking on the programme is Dr Jeff Burns, who has made a special study of elephant communication. Elephants use all their senses to communicate, but as Dr Jeff Burns explains, one way we are only just beginning to find out about is what has been referred to as silent singing. Sounds produced by elephants which are too low for humans to hear, but can be heard by other elephants. And did you know that another way in which elephants can hear is with their feet? So, when one elephant stamps on the ground, maybe to warn about danger, the sound travels through the ground, and another elephant up to 30 kilometres away may pick it up. To find out more about exactly how they do this, stay tuned to Radio 6 for Animal Talk. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear an extract from a talk about employment interviews. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. Today I have with me Sandy Richardson of the Local Workforce Center, and she'll be talking about that critical step towards the goal of employment, the interview. Sandy, what is an interview for, and what's the best way to approach it? A job interview is simply a meeting between you and a potential employer to discuss your qualifications and see if there is a fit. The employer wants to verify what they know about you and talk about your qualifications. If you have been called for an interview, you can assume that the employer is interested in you. The employer has a need that you may be able to meet, so it's your goal to identify that need and convince the employer that you're the one for the job. As everyone knows, interviews can be stressful, but when you're well prepared, there's no reason to panic. Preparation is the key to success in a job search, and you can begin by collecting together all the documents you may need for the interview, such as extra copies of your resume, lists of references, and letters of recommendation. You could also take some work samples, selecting from what you have designed, drawn, or written, for instance, and make sure you have a pen and pad of paper for taking notes. The next step is to find out about the post, the more you know about the job, the employer, and the industry, the better prepared you will be to target your qualifications. Always request a job description from the employer and research employer profiles at the Chamber of Commerce or local library. You could also try to network with people who work for the company or with employees of companies associated with it. The next step is to match your qualifications to the requirements of the job. A good approach is to write out your qualifications along with the job requirements. Think about some standard interview questions and how you might respond. Most questions are designed to find out more about you, your qualifications, or to test your reactions in a given situation. If you don't have any experience or skills in a required area, think about how you might compensate for those deficiencies. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. During an interview, it's important that you be yourself. Get a good night's sleep and plan your travel to be there in plenty of time so that you're not arriving out of breath with 30 seconds to spare. Don't, though, present yourself for the interview too early, 10 minutes at most. In the interview, listen carefully to each question asked. Take your time in responding and make sure your answers are positive. It's important to express a good attitude and show that you're willing to work, eager to learn, and are flexible. If you are unsure of a question, don't be afraid to ask for clarification. In fact, it's sometimes a good strategy to close a response with a question for the interviewer. In general, focus on your qualifications and look for opportunities to personalize the interview. Briefly answer questions with examples of how you responded in comparable situations from either your life or previous job experiences. Something you should avoid are yes or no responses to questions, but don't dwell too long on non-job related topics. Use caution if you are questioned about your salary requirements. The best strategy is to avoid the question until you have been offered a job. Questions about salary asked before there is a job offer are usually screening questions that may eliminate you from consideration, so be warned. On the other hand, it isn't inappropriate to show your enthusiasm if your first impressions of the interview and of the employer are good ones. So. If the job sounds like what you are looking for, say so. Keep in mind that the interview is not over when you are asked if you have any questions. Come prepared to ask a couple of specific questions that again show your knowledge and interest in the job. Close the interview in the same friendly, positive manner in which you started. When the interview is over, leave promptly. Don't overstay your time. Think about the interview and learn from the experience. Evaluate the success and failures. The more you learn from the interview, the easier the next one will become. You'll become much more confident. To close, here are a few more tips. First, maintain good eye contact throughout the interview and be aware of nonverbal body language. Second, dress a step above what you would wear on the job. Go to the hairdressers, have a shave, etc. Remember that your appearance is a key indicator of whether you have the right attitude, so it can pay to give some thought to how you look. And finally, don't be a clock watcher. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a woman called Phoebe, who is training to be a teacher, talking to her tutor called Tony, about research she has done in the school. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen, and answer questions 21 to 25. So, how did you get on with your school-based research, Phoebe? Well, it was exhausting, but really valuable. Good. What was the specific focus you chose? My title is Attitudes Towards Study Among 11 to 12-Year-Old Pupils. Right, and what made you choose that focus? Well, <laughs> that's a bit difficult. Lots of my classmates decided on their focus really early on, mainly on the basis of what they thought would help in their future career, you know, in their first year's teaching. So that's what helped you decide? Actually, it was that I came across a book written by experienced teachers on student attitudes, and that motivated me to go for the topic. OK. So what were your research questions or issues? Well, I wanted to look at the ways students responded to different teachers, particularly focusing on whether very strict teachers made teenagers less motivated. And from your research, did you find that was true? No, not from what I saw, you know, from my five days observation, talking to people and so forth. OK, we'll talk about the actual research methods in a moment. But before that, can you briefly summarise what your most striking findings are? Well, what really amazed me was the significant gender differences. I didn't set out to focus on that, but I found that boys were much more positive about being at school. Girls were more impatient. They talked a lot about wanting to grow up and leave school. Very interesting. Yeah, it is. From doing the research, it was clear to me that you might start out to focus on one thing, but you pick up lots of unexpected insights. Right. Did you get any insights into teaching? Yes, certainly. I was doing a lot of observations of the way kids with very different abilities collaborate on certain tasks, you know, help each other. And I began to realise that the lessons were developing in really unexpected ways. So what conclusion do you draw from that? Well, I know it's necessary for teachers to prepare lessons carefully, but it's great if they also allow lessons to go their own ways. Good point. Now I'm really pleased to see you doing this. Analyzing and drawing conclusions based on data. But surely this isn't proper data. Because it's derived from such small-scale research. Well, as long as you don't make grand claims for your findings, this data is entirely valid. Mm. I like the way you're already stepping back from the experience and thinking about what you've learned about research. Well done. But I know I could have done it better. As you become more experienced, you'll find ways to reduce the risk of difficulties. OK. Now you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. So, let's look in more detail at how you gathered your data. Let's start with lesson observation. Well, it generally went quite smoothly. I chose my focus and designed my checklist. Then teachers allowed me into their classes without any problems, which surprised me. It was afterwards that the gruelling work started. Yeah, it's very time consuming, isn't it? Making sense of analysing your observation notes. Absolutely. Much more so than interview data, for example. That was relatively easy to process, though I wanted to make sure I used a high-quality recorder to make transcription easier. And I had to wait until one became available. Right. And did you interview some kids as well? In the end, yes. I talked to ten, and they were great. I'd imagined I'd be bored listening to them, but... So it was easy to concentrate? Sure. One of the teachers was a bit worried about the ethics, you know, whether it was right to interview young pupils, and it took a while for him to agree to let me talk to three of the kids in his class, but he relented in the end. Good. What other methods did you use? I experimented with questionnaires, but I really regret that now. I decided to share the work with another student, but we had such different agendas it ended up taking twice as long. That's a shame. It might be worth you reflecting on ways you might improve on that for future projects. You're right, yeah. OK. And the other thing I did was stills photography. I didn't take as many pictures as I'd hoped to. Lack of time? 
It's pretty easy just snapping away, but I wanted each snap to have a purpose, you know, that would contribute to my research aims, and I found that difficult. Well, that's understandable, but remember... That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. Now listen to the second part of the lecture. As you listen, complete the notes below. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Many typically American characteristics, individualism, self-reliance, informality, punctuality, and directness are a result of those values mentioned earlier. Other national traits could also be identified, however. 1. Americans cooperate. Although often competitive, Americans also have a good sense of teamwork and cooperate with others to achieve a goal. 2. Americans are friendly, but in their own way. In general, friendships among Americans tend to be shorter and more casual than friendships among people from other cultures. This has something to do with American mobility and the fact that Americans do not like to be dependent on other people. Americans also tend to compartmentalize friendships, having friends at work, family friends, friends on the softball team, etc. 3. Americans ask a lot of questions, some of which may to you seem pointless, uninformed, or elementary. Someone you have just met may ask you very personal questions. No impertinence is intended. The questions usually grow out of a genuine interest. 4. Americans tend to be internationally naive. Many Americans are not very knowledgeable about international geography or world affairs. They may ask uninformed questions about current events and may display ignorance of world geography. Because the US is not surrounded by many other nations, some Americans tend to ignore the world. 5. Silence makes Americans nervous. Americans are not comfortable with silence. They would rather talk about the weather than deal with silence in a conversation. 6. Americans are open and usually eager to explain. If you do not understand certain behaviour or want to know what makes Americans tick, do not hesitate to ask questions. Just as values and traits differ somewhat from one culture to another, so do the personal habits associated with good manners and courtesy. While very often there does not seem to be any particular reason why a particular way of doing something is considered good manners, observing these cultural rules will make Americans more comfortable with you, and therefore you with them. It is, of course, impossible to cover all the possibilities here. If you are unsure in a situation, just ask. Americans like to be helpful. 1. Queuing up or lining up is essential. Courtesy requires that you do not push from behind, stand next to the person being helped, or cut into a line. If you should accidentally bump someone, you should say, excuse me. 2. Americans blow their noses into a tissue. Spitting, clearing phlegm, or sniffing as from a cold are considered rude. 3. It is considered poor manners to slurp, chew noisily, or open your mouth while chewing. 4. Questions are seen as a good way of getting acquainted, but questions about a person's age, financial affairs, cost of clothing or personal belongings, religious affiliations and sex life are considered too personal for questioning, except between very close friends. 5. Men generally do not hold hands or link arms in public with other men. This is somewhat more acceptable between women and quite common between men and women. Now, 
a few words about personal safety. Unfortunately, in the US, one must be aware of crimes. It is wise to be especially careful until you are familiar with the community in which you live. Remember that good judgment and common sense can significantly reduce chances of having an unpleasant and perhaps harmful experience. Basic safety rules include the following. 1. Do not walk alone at night. 2. When you leave your room, apartment or automobile, make sure that all doors are locked and all windows are secured. 3. Do not carry too much cash or wear jewellery of great value. 4. Never accept a ride from a stranger. Do not hitchhike and do not pick up hitchhikers. 5. Be careful of purses and wallets, especially in crowded metropolitan areas where there may be purse snatchers and pickpockets. 6. If a robber threatens you, at home or on the street, try not to resist unless you feel that your life is in danger and you must fight or run away. Give up your valuables as calmly as you can and observe as much as possible about the robber to tell the police when you report the crime. A final note. Keep an open mind. Don't judge what you see as right or wrong, but make it a challenge to try to understand the variety of American behaviours which you may observe. You certainly do not have to participate in something you disagree with, but you can try to understand it. This will help you build an attitude of intelligent and liberated respect for cultures, both your own and others. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.